Um, today we have a guest speaker, Sharita Johnson. Uh, she is from CUNY Urban Food Policy Institute. Today's conversation is about what the youth can do to apply themselves to any type of social justice and food justice. But I also like to start off our conversations always with an icebreaker. Uh, my initial icebreaker was uh, what types of pantry items must you have in your house at all given times? However, because of the climate, I would like to change the focus a little bit and just ask you a simple question of how are you doing? Um, how am I doing? I am a mix of emotions right now. Um, you know, just trying to push through the days, um, you know, being in the midst of a pandemic and then also being in the midst of civil unrest. I know that it's a difficult time for all of us, you know, we're all trying to make the most of it mentally, um, physically, and just trying to stay on track with every single responsibility that we have in front of us. Um, but overall, you know, I'm the type of person that looks for good even in the midst of, of darkness and craziness. And so, you know, I'm remaining optimistic um, that, you know, um, we will ultimately get to complete justice, especially for uh, the black community. And, you know, I'm really happy to be here today and to be here speaking with you all about you know, food justice and social justice, because I think that's a, a big part of the inequities that communities of color, low income communities, underserved groups face. So I'm doing okay. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I'm going to go with our first question and just twist it up a little bit. What do you think is the biggest issue facing our food systems today, especially now that there is a strict curfew in place and moving around and getting food to those people who actually need it is going to be a lot harder? Yeah, I mean, you know, I think the biggest issue is one access. There's multiple issues. Um, but I think one of the biggest ones is access, especially when it comes to underserved and low-income communities. We see that there's limited access of healthy and affordable, as well as culturally relevant foods. That's a big issue. And even now in the midst of the pandemic, it's even more difficult to get those the foods that are um, healthy, affordable, and culturally relevant. Um, I also feel that um, systemic uh, racial issues that have been embedded into our food system is a big issue as well. Uh, we see that in um, Harlem, which is a few blocks from um, the Upper East Side, we see that the food landscapes are completely different in both communities, even though they're two blocks apart. So in East Harlem, we see that there's higher, um, um, more, um, uh, fast food restaurants compared to supermarkets, whereas in the Upper East Side, you know, there is more opportunities for healthful foods to get access to healthful foods. So I think um, access as well as um, the systemic racial issues that are embedded into our food systems are the major um, things that we need to um, adjust. And I think now in our political climate, is the one of those things it should be one of those things that are um i wouldn't say at the forefront but should it should be a, a um at the top a top priority as well the next question is about empowerment you have a youth organization that you work with and they kind of like mirror our program but it's mostly focused on food justice yeah. um what is the age range for for your youth program yeah so we have um three different youth programs. So one is our Youth Food Educators Program. Um, that's for young people between the ages of 13 to 18. And we train them to be healthy food advocates in their community, specifically advocating for healthier marketing in their community. We see that lower income communities are inundated with pervasive and predatory unhealthy marketing for fast food restaurants. Um, think about Wendy's 4 for 4 and you know the whole craze with the Popeye's chicken sandwich that happened um, you know so we just want to give young people in that respect the 
um, the tools and the autonomy to advocate for healthier marketing in their community. Uh, the next program that we have is the Good Food Jobs Training Program, which is a program that trains young people for entry level jobs in the healthy food sector. So it's sort of like a, a culinary training program, but we focus on healthy food preparation. So what are what makes a food healthy? Why is nutrition important? Um, and why as a as someone going into the culinary field, why is um, having a, the basis of health and nutrition important? And for that um, group, we recruit young people ages 18 to 25. And our specific uh, target population are um, young people who um, are not working and not in school to offer opportunities for career advancement to those young people. Um, and we also ensure or um, make it a priority to pay our young people as well. We believe that that's extremely important, especially when working with um, underserved groups and low income groups, we don't feel that it's fair to have them um, training and not providing any type of um, financial incentive. Um, so that's our second program. Our third one is our CUNY Food Justice Leadership Fellowship Program, which is our um, most newest program. And we work with um, CUNY students um, that are between the ages of 18 to 25. And we train them to on um, pretty much all the ins and outs of food justice. So um, we offer continued engagement for food justice, how to engage in civic um, engagement, how to be an advocate. And um, the ultimate goal is to give them the tools and the resources that they need to pursue a career in food justice. So they're getting the education that they need and then from the CUNY side, and then we um, give them sort of like the, the tangible tangible skills. Um, and there for that program, it's an 18-month fellowship. Um, and we work with them for 12 months to give them intensive training on different food uh, justice topics and food justice issues. And then they go on to do a six-month internship at a food justice organization of their choice. And we work with them to develop a project um, that aligns with the mission of that organization. And uh, those young people receive up to $4,000 for their partic participation in the fellowship. So those are the, the three ways that we um, sort of work with, that I sort of work with young people and my organization works with young people. Working with CUNY myself, I'm an adjunct for CUNY. I am a San oh. I'm a sanitarian and I'm also a chef instructor and Corey is a RD and Selena's a RD. We're all in the education field some way, mm -hmm. somehow. But I know um, I work for Kingsborough Community College and they have an urban farm that unfortunately yeah. had to undergo some cuts recently. So there is a pantry on campus and I believe there's pantries on most CUNY campuses. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, if they have been frequented by the students and, it, and are the pantries open to your students as well? Because I know when it comes to continuing education, the rules are a little mm -hmm. bit different. Yeah. So um, my organization, we're based out of the CUNY um, Graduate School of Public Health and Health Policy. So we are a, a continuing education school. So unfortunately, we do not have a food pantry on site. Uh, but like Doris mentioned, uh, we most of the CUNY schools do have a food pantry and provide food to the students that go to that school. And uh, during the, the pandemic now, um, what they're doing is that they're allowing students to still come up, come and pick up food from their respective campuses, but they have to call and make an appointment before beforehand. Um, the students have been, um, even before the pandemic, they have been um, making, taking advantage of the services. Um, and even in the midst of the pandemic, they're doing the same. And the coordinators of the food pantries are doing everything that they can to ensure that um, they stay safe, that the students stay safe, and that they receive the food in a safe manner. Um, in the previously, uh, before the pandemic, um, students were also receiving vouchers from uh, their schools to get food either from the cafeteria or to get food, free food from local restaurants that they've developed partnerships with. Um, and it's at the forefront now to ensure that CUNY students have access to food. Uh, we are, my organization recently did a study where we found out that the majority of CUNY students are food insecure, which is a big issue. So what exactly can we do to sort of combat that? What are, what is, 
CUNY schools doing that it's good to combat food um, insecurity and what can we do more of? So that's something that my organization along with um, other CUNY schools are discussing. You not only work for CUNY, but you have your own business. And would you like to tell us a little bit about your business? Sure. So I have a business called My Soulful Nutrition, and it's a business that focuses on teaching people how to make healthier versions of their favorite comfort foods. And the reason why um, this is, uh, I, I had this idea of this business is because for many of us, food is cultural. Food is an important part of our lives. And food um, invokes a lot of different emotions, especially like, you know, Thanksgiving, nostalgia. Um, for example, for me, my grandmother passed away when I was 12 years old and she always used to make different um, treats. So she used to make um, something called coconut tart, which is essentially a pastry with shredded coconut and um, uh, uh, cinnamon all mixed together with like sugar and it's really tasty. Um, she also used to make beef patties. And so for me, that makes me think about my grandmother, makes me think about my heritage and my history. And for many people who have, you know, different diet related diseases and their physicians tell them to cut out certain foods, it's hard because food is cultural. Food is a, we have a deep connection to food. So my mission is to teach people how to still enjoy their favorite cultural foods, but in a healthier manner. Um, and I also, um, am in the process of becoming a, a registered dietitian. So I um, also provide like meal planning support, um, nutrition counseling, et cetera. Now that you have two separate organizations that you represent, your own and as well as CUNY, how do you feel the pandemic in the current state of Black Lives Matter? And I just want to let everybody know that the Sylvia said their stand with the Black Lives Matter um, movement. Um, we're posting resources on our Instagram page, on the feed, if you guys wanted to check that out. But I know it's been a little hard to be in contact with our students during the pandemic. And um, now it's even harder considering, you know, all of the riots and, and the protests and, you know, everything that's going on. And a part of it is they have just clocked out. You know, it's been, it's been stressful for yeah. them. Are you having trouble getting in contact with the people who participated in your programs? That's a great question. So for one program, um, the we have been able to get in contact with everyone. There hasn't been any issues. Um, all the, the participants in this specific program are CUNY students, so they all have access to laptops, et cetera. Um, a lot of them have checked out though, and that's um, one of the things that we are, you know, concerned about, but we also understand, you know, one of our students was like, you know, she really does not enjoy um, the online learning and feels that why why should I have to pay, you know, all this money and tuition to learn over a computer? And I, I totally agree with her. You know, it's um, it's really a disservice to the students at this moment. But we're also doing the best that we can with the resources that we have during this time. Um, and in one of our, our other programs, the Good Food Jobs Training Program, we work with a, a different target population and demographic. Um, a lot of our students are living in subsidized housing, and which is known notorious for not having the best, you know, internet access and connections and Wi-Fi. So it's been really hard to connect with those young people. Some of them, they don't have their phones are shut off. They don't check their emails. What we've been doing is instead of having um, them sign in for a specific class time, we've been recording our, you know, presentations and lectures and posting assignments on Google Classroom and letting them do it on their leisure when they have access to do it in, in order to accommodate them. Um, but, you know, it, it's a very challenging time and we have to, we have to adapt our programming in order to um, reach our young people and in, in, in order to support them as well, because they're going through a lot um, as well. This question is about how they are currently supplying meals from the schools and they are also doing the the school ebt cards for all of the public school yeah. students which is great mm -hmm. yeah what i've noticed in my area is that a lot of the food that the schools are supplying is being underutilized mm -hmm. are you having that same problem in your area 
as far as my area, I don't live in New York City, so oh. our sort of system is a little bit different. Um, we do have the same structure where um, people can go to the school and pick up baggies of, of prepackaged meals, so like a juice box, um, a sandwich, et cetera. Um, but I'm not really sure in my neighborhood what the what um, what it looks like. But I know for in New York City, the, um, a lot of people are scared to even leave their house to go um, to the schools, to the different food hubs that are within schools to get the free meals, which has been a big issue. We have been talking about what are some things that can be done to ensure that the people who need the food are, are getting them. Um, delivery services ha have come up. I believe there were talks that different um, taxis were um, supposed to be delivering food to people in need. So hopefully that helps to get the food to those who need it. But I think there's a big concern among uh, individuals not wanting to leave their house and not wanting to put themselves at risk. I know um, I have family in Maryland and what they were doing there is they continued to keep the bus routes open. So mm -hmm. the bus, the school bus drivers would pick up the lunches and make sure that everybody was at that bus stop to pick up their lunches. Mm -hmm. I was hoping that we would adapt to that, but we do have mm -hmm. that taxi service. And, um, you know, it's, it's just sad to see how much food is being wasted Right. But the yeah. majority of the waste is coming out of fear, just people mm -hmm. afraid to come outside. So thank you for right. pointing them out. This question is is not only because of the pandemic, but um, the whole movement that's going on as well. Why do you feel that price gouging is so high in urban neighborhoods? One, I think, well, Latinos and um, African Americans have the largest buying power out of any race. And um, it's not, and also in uh, urban neighborhoods, they're the population is predominantly um, African-American and Latinos. And also um, in the midst of the pandemic, it's also supply and demand thing. So when things are more in demand, the prices go up. So I think all of those different factors contribute to um, the, pri the price gouging in neighborhoods. In addition, um, I know that so I've I've heard that some factories, specifically meat factories, a lot of their um, employees are scared to come in because uh, you know they don't want to contract the virus or they're either sick. And so meat production has gone down. And so in order to compensate for losses, the prices have gone up. I've seen that in my neighborhood too, where you know um, a pound of chicken used to be like ninety nine cent. Now it's three fifty. You know, so things of that nature. I think it's um, all con contributing to the price gouging. Yeah. Um, and it, there's not much that we can do about it because right. right now it's, you got to buy what you can. Yeah, we all um, need it. We all need the Lysol, the Clorox, yeah. the gloves. Like, you know, in my neighborhood, those things are crazy high too. And it's, it's like, okay, well, we have to buy it because we need it, you know? And I think um, some business owners are aware of that and taking advantage of it. But I also think some business owners, you know, the, the bottom end price is higher for them, which is why they're putting the prices higher too. Even now, the meat factories, there was an outbreak in the meat factories. So now mm -hmm. people are starting to see the price reflected on certain types of protein or even uh, ice cream. Mm -hmm. Ice cream is a byproduct of a, of a cow. Right, and, right. You know, you need people to actually be on site to milk the cows. And if you don't mm -hmm. have that anymore, what ends up happening is there's a scarcity. If there's a scarcity, right. then the prices go up. What what are you guys doing with your your youth to help them get through the current crises? Mm -hmm. We're being um, gentle with them. So. Um, and we're being um, as empathetic and as understanding as we can. Um, you know, our specifically with our fellowship, it's a pretty rigorous fellowship. Um, it's a lot of, I wouldn't say a lot of work involved, but a lot of expectation. Um, they're expected to do assignments, turn them in on time. If they don't turn it in on time, that could affect the stipend that they would receive. But we're giving more leeway. We're giving more flexibility because we understand there's so many different things that are going on that can impact their physical, mental, 
emotional health. And so we want to be as um, accommodating as possible. We're also sharing as much resources as we can. A lot of our fellows, um, a lot of our young people in our fellowship program have experienced personal loss in their families. Some of them have even um, contracted the virus. Some of them have lost their jobs. So we are connecting them to as many financial mental health resources as we can. Recently, the chancellor of CUNY um, had put together a relief fund for CUNY students and they could apply to get us a certain amount of money. So we um, shared that resource with them. We asked them, you know, if there's anything that we could do to help you fill out your application, let us know. So I think just um, meeting them wherever they have a need as best as they can is what we've been trying to do. What can we as an organization and as teenagers do to help everything that's going on right now? Yeah. Or what do you feel that we can do to help? Yeah, I think, you know, even having, um, you know, uh, meetings like this, having programs like this is helping, um, you know, Food justice is a big issue. Like I mentioned, um, it's especially with um, racial undertones embedded into it. And so just having these conversations, gathering young people to talk about these issues is one step in the right direction. I also think that organizations um, standing in solidarity with the protesters, with the Black Lives Matter movement um, and supporting um, these different initiatives is beneficial. And I also wanna stress that, you know, young people are never too young to make a difference. No one is never too young to make a difference. And um, everyone has their specific unique gifts and talents that are here to change this world. I firmly believe that we're all unique individuals. We all have something to offer this world. And so I wanna encourage you all to think about that. Think about how can, what is my gift and talent and how can I make a difference? And it doesn't have to be on this big um, wide, you know, reach. It could be with your own friends, within your own community, even with your family, you know, think about how can I make a difference and also um, connect with you know, other like-minded people, even being in this session right now, you're making a difference. So yeah, I think ultimately that's what, what we can do is continue to do what we're doing and look for opportunities to, to do more, you know? And I think once we're seeking those opportunities, they will naturally fall into place and fall into our laps. Thank you so much, Sharita. Okay, guys, at this time, I will allow you all to turn your mics on. If you guys would like to ask any questions, so we can have a small Q&A session with Sharita. Yeah, so what makes a good food job? So a good food job um, offers healthy food, especially to low-income communities. It also trains, it provides training to its workers. It provides a living wage to its workers. And it also provides safe working conditions for its workers. So all of those four factors um, make up what a good food job is. And so our good food jobs training program um, is based off of those four foundations. And so we um, train young people for entry level jobs in the healthy food sector, focuses on healthy food preparation and the different um, job organizations that we work with align with good food jobs. So we make sure that they are paying our young people living wages, they're offering training, um, and they're also offering safe working conditions and help to promote um, and offer healthy foods in the community. So this is a, a program that we work with in partnership with Youth Action, Youth Build. Um, in the past, we used to work with Youth Action, Youth Build, Seed Co. and the Isaac Centers, the Isaac Center, but now we only work with Youth Action, Youth Build. Um, and they are, um, they have the, the connections to the various organizations that we place our young people at internships at, as well as jobs. And so um, it's sort of like a, a happy, I would say a happy marriage for us because uh, CUNY, we focus on um, the, the training portion when it comes to healthy food preparation, what is good food jobs, and then uh, Youth Action Youth Build, um, they connect the young people to the different internship sites. They focus on job readiness, so how to write a cover letter, how to write a resume, how to interview, um, how to um, tactf tactfully navigate conflict, et cetera. Um, and so together, we feel that our partnership is, has been really good. Um, we just finished our third cohort of the program, and we're hoping to get additional funding to do another cohort.
Yeah. And then mm-hmm. you said something about the living wage. I'm not sure mm-hmm. our, our students understand what the living wage is. Can you explain it a little bit? Yeah. So it's essentially, um, you know, a wage that a uh, pay your your pay, um, whatever you get paid, you should be able to live off of and live off of comfortably. So not, you know, struggling or living paycheck to paycheck. But um, for many, you know, adults, even young people, the minimum wage is not enough. You know, we're not able to go out and get an apartment, you know, have food, pay our bills and pay for transportation with that, with that, you know, salary, that salary, that wage. And so good food jobs, we focus on placing our young people in jobs where they are able to, you know, pay for their household expenses, um, have food, have transportation, pay for clothes, pay for their basic necessities and have um, money left over. In addition to um, the training, we also teach our young people how to financial planning, which is really important because you can make you know a, a living wage, but if you don't know how to save and spend your money, then you know you're going to end up you know not having enough money to last you throughout the month. So we we teach them the importance of financial responsibility and how to make a budget that's within your means. It's great to have someone who is so powerful as you are to to close this out, especially in the current climate that we're actually in. Thank you so, so much. Thank you for having me. Um, And honestly, this was the highlight of my week. This week has been very low for many of us, but um, this was nice. It was really refreshing to be able to to speak to all of you, even though I didn't hear from you guys, Um, but that's okay. Um, But just to know that you guys are here and listening was was great. Um, And I appreciate you, Corey and Doris and everyone else for the opportunity. Thank you.